Thank you very much. Well, as we were expecting, I think that was quite an inspirational beginning to the day. Great to hear the value and the respect and the, the admiration, I suppose, from elsewhere, but also the, the realization that it costs a lot of money. Um, OK, I'm going to lead our sixth session of this event. It um, doesn't necessarily have a title, but I suppose what the, the main theme across the five talks you're going to see is the fact that peatlands are a lot more than just the science, that there, there is art, there's creativity, there's culture involved. Um, there's, there's various other uses, uh, and I think we need to reflect on that and, uh, and recognize it as well as being a fundamental part of this. Um, we've got five speakers, as I said, and um, we have Tina Claffey, who is a world-renowned nature photographer. We have Fergal Monaghan, who is from the Hen Harrier EIP project. We have Alec Copland from Inish Environmental Consultants, Monica DeBath from Creative for Fangan Mehel, and many, many others, and our own Catherine Farrell, who will round off the session. Um, so without further ado, I'm not going to spend too long introducing you because we're tight on time. I'm going to introduce Tina Claffey, please. So Tina, if you could share your screen and certainly turn your camera on as well, and we'll get things going. Great, Tina, you're working at your end. Can you share slides if you can? I can, one moment, please. Okay. No. I was told that I was supposed to be too okay. fast yesterday, so I'll slow down. <laughs> Great, okay. Uh, your screen is starting. Oh. I can see it at my end, okay. so take it away. One second now, I'll just start and start. Okay, here we are. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm truly delighted and honoured to be here today as part of this wonderful peatland gathering. Hi, Tina. Oh, I'm just go going to. Um, there, yeah. yeah, sorry, just going to interrupt you there to go to full screen. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I've been fascinated with the flora and fauna of our bogs and wetlands for over 10 years now. I specialise in macro photography, which is extreme close up photography, which allows me to capture the tiny wonders within this living carpet that can easily be passed by unseen. I'd like to share some of these wonders with you this morning and I hope you enjoy it. So we start with sphagnum moss, really is the champion plant. Uh, without sphagnum moss, we'd have no bogs. Forming the living surface of this magical carpet and holding up to 20 times their own weight in water, these beautiful mosses also host the bogs plant and tiny fauna. There are so many species, each one a wonder to look at through the macro lens. And this is frog spawn, the first signs of life in the spring. The sun was shining and lit a reed below the surface, illuminating one cell of frog spawn. As I looked through the macro lens, it appeared as if an eye was looking back at me, the eye of mother nature herself. And surely one of the greatest architects in the bog is the caddisfly. It builds this amazing structure from reeds which houses its aquatic body. This wonderful creation protects it from predators as it develops and its weight keeps it submerged. This caddisfly has gained its wings, leaving its house behind. And this is bog bean. This little beauty um, can be found in the shallow bog pools. Its petals are fringed with long white hairs and are a joy to look at through the macro lens. Horsetail is an amazing vascular plant whose ancestors date back to the time of the dinosaurs 100 million years ago. This beauty is emerging from the bog pool, towering over the beautiful and very aptly named bog beacon fungi as the sun illuminates its yellow tip. So tiny, but so regal, this is a micro moth. I imagine that he's a king in the winged world, his regal wings like a cape, his furry crown, and that scarlet red eye looking directly at me. And this dark tussock moth caterpillar was feeding on bog cotton. I was fascinated by its little feet as it moved up and down the stalk of the plant. So the sundew, this is the sundew, and the sundew is my favorite plant on the bog. It's a stunning example of how many species have adapted to survive in the sterile conditions in the bog. This beauty is a deadly carnivore. Insects are attracted to its sweet, sticky tentacles, and once they land on it, they're doomed. The tentacles close over the insect, and the sundew receives the nitrogen it needs. 
This is also a sundew. This is the great sundew or long leaved sundew. Poised like a cobra, this beauty appeared to me like it was going to strike my lens at any moment. This is bog acid, which is like a chameleon in the bog. It completely transforms its color throughout the season. This is its summer form, and to me it's at its most beautiful. And this is the raft spider, which is our largest spider here in Ireland. It doesn't spin webs to capture its prey. It's semi-aquatic, hunting on and under the water. This is a female carrying her precious cargo, her egg sac. She carries it for up to three weeks, then finds a safe spot for it, lays it down and builds a small web around it, guarding her little spiderlings until they emerge. This otherworldly creature is the caterpillar of the sallow kitten moth. To the naked eye, it looks like a tiny curled up leaf and only the macro lens can reveal its amazing identity. This marsh fritillary butterfly had just emerged and was drying its wings. And this allowed me to get as close as possible to observe its wonderful structure, a tapestry of nature. And these are mating emperor moths. I was deep in thought photographing this freshly emerged female emperor moth when she was joined by a much smaller male. Freshly emerged females release a unique chemical signature, a pheromone that's irresistible to males. The male can detect her from kilometers away. I felt so privileged to witness this rarely seen event. This tiny lichen could hardly be seen by the naked eye. But what a treat when viewed through the lens up close. The morning dew had encapsulated its orange tip, creating this otherworldly orb of dew. It could do such an incredible color as that of the green elf cup. It's neither green nor blue, but a combination of both. I found this beauty on rotted wood in the wet woodlands. Two minutes remaining, Tina. Perfect, thank you. You can tell how the shield bug gets its name. Its back resembles the shape of a knight's shield. This birch shield bug was heavily covered in morning dew and looked like a shield, this looked like its shield was encrusted with ruby jewels. This tiny white reindeer lichen looked to me like an enchanted ghostly tree from another world. Bracken fern turns from green in spring and summer to gold and deep orange in the autumn, receding in a blaze of glory in the evening sun. This is the devil's matchstick lichen, famous for its scarlet red tips. I singled out this beauty on a frosty morning and it looked like a lone tree in a frosted lunar landscape. As I explored the bog in midwinter, a tiny sphagnum moss caught my eye as the sun lit up the ice in a shallow bog pool. When I looked through the lens, it took my breath away. The frozen sphagnum was perfectly preserved in the ice, as if in suspended animation, surrounded by a galaxy of tiny frozen oxygen bubbles. This is my book, Tapestry of Light, which was launched in 2017. It's now sold out, but I am working towards a new book uh, for next year. Fingers crossed. And this is my website, tinaclaffey.com, and all of my social media um, handles there, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and email. So I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. And um, back to you, Shane. Thank you very much. Tina, wow. That was like a fog meditation first thing this morning. And nice and soothed and calm again. Also strong evidence that size doesn't matter, right? <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, thanks very much for that. Really, really fascinating. Um, next speaker here is Fergal Monaghan, um, and Fergal's going to be talking about the landscape level interventions on blanket bogs and heats. So Fergal, if you can share, please, and take it away.
Dus ik een onmiere welke is werk. Great, I can hear you there now. Just share away. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you have bank details you could show us too, that would be great. My bank details will be of no interest to anyone <laughs> or no value. Um, you just unshare and then share again. Thank you. Up at the top of the screen. Sorry, can you see that now? Not quite yet. Not yet, no. Um, While you're working on that, Virgil, it's great to see Tina's book there currently available um, and a couple of questions coming in about when your next book is available. So maybe you can, you can come back to us later on about that news if there is any news. Um, okay, if you can go full screen there, please. Uh, Virgil, we can see it at our end. Can you see it? There we go. Uh, we're on presenter mode there. So if you can, um, I think it's display settings, is it, Yusuf? Yes, if you go into display settings up at the top there. There you go. Are we in business? We are. Okay. We are indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Hen Harrier project is about more than just hen harriers. We work with farming communities managing high nature value farmland across Ireland, and we try to support them in the delivery of a whole suite of ecosystem services. But the fate of a specialist predator like the hen harrier can tell us a lot about the landscape and how well it functions ecologically. The six hen harrier SPAs are spread across nine counties from Monaghan to West Cork. They are hilly rather than mountainous, a mix of forestry, blanket bog, heaths and grasslands. The farms, for the most part, are suckler operations and few could be described as financially rewarding. These areas are home to approximately 50% of Ireland's breeding hen harriers and are important for other species such as curlew and merlin. While the challenges faced in these landscapes are many, I would like to focus on just two, the impact of forestry and how we deal with wildfires. Forestry occupies 52% of the hen harrier SPAs, but its impact is not restricted to habitat loss. The fragmentation of what remains is a major concern. Forestry expansion was based on land availability and not suitability a pattern of development that had a very negative effect on ground nesting birds. The hen harrier's hunting technique works well in open habitats, flying low, often along linear features, using its keen senses to locate the small birds and rodents on which it preys. However, in mature forestry, prey is scarce and often uncatchable for hen harriers. When rearing chicks, hen harriers need to catch a lot of meadow pipits and bank foals. In a fragmented landscape, this means traveling further from the nest to hunt. This slows down the supply of food with serious consequences for the smallest chicks. Forestry can also create ecological traps where birds are tempted to nest, but which expose them to a deadly danger from predators. While predation is natural, proximity to forestry increases its impact to unsustainable levels. Most predated nests fail just before the chicks fledge by which stage the chicks are noisy and easily detectable to a passing fox. If a nest is too close to forestry, the chances are it will be found and this will end badly for the young harriers. With hardly anywhere in the SPA network more than 500 metres from forestry, this is a serious threat to the population. Spring wildfires are an annual event in our uplands. Large fires such as we witnessed in Killarney this year provoke a lot of outrage, a lot of condemnation and a desire to find someone to blame. But when the fire is put out, the story stops. No one asks, why was this landscape so vulnerable? Why was our capacity to respond so limited? And no one ever asks, how do we break out of this cycle? Addressing these issues demands cooperation between agriculture, conservation interests and forestry. As we have seen, many of the threats exist at the landscape level, and the solutions to these challenges requires a landscape level response. No single landowner can effectively deal with the wildfire threat 
or with excessive predation. A coordinated response is necessary. What is the landscape level intervention? Well, I believe it is one or more of the following characteristics. It has a benefit beyond the boundary of the farm. It may require the coordination of actions by multiple farmers or land managers, or it requires strategic oversight. Investment in landscape level interventions can optimize the value of the environmental outputs from many farms. While habitat improvements can increase feeding opportunities for lesser horseshoe bats, the benefits may not be realized if suitable winter and summer roosts are not available. Filling this gap enhances the biodiversity outcomes from everyone's efforts. For forestry, we need a long-term solution to reduce the edge impact from plantations. We need to consolidate their shape. We need to consider removing some parcels altogether. And we need to increase the size and quality of areas more than 500 meters from forestry plantations. We need to make our landscape less vulnerable to fire. We need to increase our capacity to respond to events and we need to manage the recovery after a fire. We must support farmers in reintroducing cattle to the hills. Focusing grazing where it is needed can make a big difference. The use of hen harrier project feed blocks addresses the nutritional deficiencies in a diet of millennia and attracts cattle to where they are needed to reduce the fuel load. We must put the data that we collect to use. The Hen Harrier Project worked closely with the fire services during the 2018 Schlieve Blooms fire. Nest locations were successfully incorporated into the fire plan, protecting nests and minimizing the impact on the species. Fire services increasingly rely on helicopters to combat wildfires. In most areas, sourcing water for helicopters is not difficult, but in West Limerick, there are no lakes. In areas like this, the distance to water reduces the frequency of drops, increasing the damage, the costs, and the disturbance to wildlife. Farmers can help, and working with them, the project is developing a network of multi-purpose ponds accessible for helicopters of wildlife value in themselves and a source of drinking water for livestock. The one pictured here could fill 250 Bambi buckets for firefighting. Two minutes remaining, Virgo. This farmer is facilitating the protection of over 30,000 hectares from fire, land that contains forestry assets, hen harrier habitat, farmland and homes. A great example of public goods from agriculture, an output from the farm that benefits everyone. And finally, we must manage the recovery. At the site of the Black Banks fire pictured here, the project and local farmers are mowing strategically sited fuel breaks in the millennia, planting willow fire breaks and forest edges, are breaking up high gorse and boundaries by interspersing it with less flammable willow and black pine. By doing this, we are isolating high risk ignition points from the rest of the site and reinforcing barriers to the spread of fire. We are giving the chance a site to recover. I'd like to describe the solution to the challenges we face as a rope, a rope woven from many strands. Together they have real strength, but each, strength, each strand that is lost weakens the rope, perhaps to the point of failure. If we as a society wish to achieve a solution to the climate and biodiversity crises, we need to work as one. We need to make the rope as strong as possible. We have to move on from just collecting data to calculate and issue a payment in farm programs. We have to look at the data to inform a range of processes that collectively create the strands needed to give real strength to our approach. It looks complicated, but it is really quite simple. On the left, we have inputs, in the center processes, and on the right outputs. It is a plan to optimize the value of everyone's efforts and ensure that real results are delivered. There are trade-offs involved and consideration to local priorities will have to be made, but with care, agricultural supports can play a useful role in maintaining these habitats, provided we move our focus beyond the field and farm level and consider the larger landscape and community issues. Thank you very much. Virgil, that was really brilliant. Um, it's great to see the value of a, a charismatic umbrella species um, and, and the, the utility of that to, to do much greater work. And also that it, it involves 
a varying suite of stakeholders and, and buy-in, I suppose, too. Um, that's brilliant. If you want to knock your video off there, please. Uh, next up, we have Alec Copland um, from Inish Environmental Consultants. Uh, he'll be speaking about peatland bird communities in Ireland. Um, so we will, I see your videos on there, Alec, great. Um, if you can try sharing and we'll see if we're good to go. You're coming up here now, that's great. Um, and full screen match and we're good. Brilliant, okay, off you go. Uh, great. great, thanks very much, Shane. Um, and thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation to come along and talk about, I suppose, what is a, a personal as well, a professional passion of mine, peatland bird communities. And I guess just to follow on from Fergal, talk there that the peatland bird communities that we have I mean the birds themselves are special but they're the flagship for um, the much wider landscape the ecosystems um, that that occur in these peatland areas and, and you know they really go down to you know from following on from Tina's talk about the macro level that if it wasn't for this wonderful unique habitat and the species um, that occur there we wouldn't have these fantastic birds to look at. I'm going to run through very quickly um, some of the peatland, the different kinds of peatlands and the bird communities that we have there. And I suppose I'd start with what we would consider to be intact uh, peatlands. It could be um, blanket bog or, or raised bog. Um, I haven't put in hen harrier here quite specifically because obviously Fargal was uh, more of an expert in hen harrier than I, I would be. But we could certainly add hen harrier there as well as some other really iconic species, red grouse, curlew, uh, skylark and meadow pipit. The one thing I suppose to note from many of these species is that, that there's not too many of them. When you go out and walk across an area of bog, um, there aren't huge densities of birds. That the, the bird song isn't deafening. There's not uh, birds all around you as you may get in a in a broadleaf woodland in Killarney, for example. But the few species that are there tend to be that little bit more special, that little bit harder to see, um, and therefore I always think that little bit more rewarding. Um, we can imagine walking across a section of bog and in the distance you may hear um, a red grouse calling, you may hear the call of the curlew, you may have a skylark singing up in the air above you. These are very evocative feelings that they, they kind of stir, um, I think, emotions within us. Um, and many of these species are, are species of very serious conservation concern. You can see in the list there, um, many species are red listed, they're, they're, they're threatened um, with not being in Ireland anymore. Um, and I think that's a real challenge for, for, for us all to deal with. But of course, again, um, we're not focusing on how threatened these birds are perhaps. And I think that the target is no longer doing measures to, to, to sort of protect individual birds, but rather measures to look at the entire ecosystem. These again, they're flagship species, they're indicators of these larger areas of, of, of um, functioning ecosystems, which are under threat, which are being challenged um, in, in our modern landscapes. Um, moving on, I suppose, from these intact bog bird communities, we can then move on to what we might consider to be our degraded uh, bog bird communities. And on degraded bogs, you have pretty much everything there from the bare production bog that you might see throughout the Midlands, um, which, have been, which have been harvested for fuel and for peat for many years. Um, you may see areas that have been planted with conifers. But equally, you may see areas of bog that have been drained and where woodland has come in um, onto the drier uh, surface. And those woodlands will have very different uh, communities of birds um, than the open landscapes would. There may also be open lakes. Um, uh, and we still see that on some of the cutaway sites which have been um, drained, where the peat was extracted and where um, the pumps were turned off following peat extraction. We have large lake systems. Um, and where that's happened for a long time, we may see reed beds starting to develop. And these landscapes become incredibly diverse, incredibly complex. Along with um, these areas, we do still have some special birds that come in and use these degraded sites. And I suppose that we have these special birds coming on to these peatlands um, because they're under pressure in the wider landscape. So it's not just peatlands that are under pressure but actually a lot of our wider landscape is under pressure from lots and lots of different uses from agriculture, particularly agricultural intensification, from afforestation and particularly the growing of monoculture uh, spruce crops, from our ever expanding um, population and, and the, the need for houses and developments and towns, 
um, that are putting more and more pressure on wildlife and forcing them in to um, more and more sites that perhaps are not ideal, that are perhaps not perfect for them. Um, and many of the bogs, whether they're degraded or whether they're intact and in very, very good condition, nevertheless, all provide really important habitats, really important resources for our wildlife, um, where they just don't see it as, as much. They're coming under pressure, I suppose, through much of the wider countryside. So that leads us on to, well, what can we do um, if we are talking about rehabilitating bogs, and, and that was talked about, I suppose, yesterday, it's been talked about this morning already, it's going to be talked about again today. How do we restore? How do we rehabilitate? What do we do with our people? Um, and there's a huge conversation about this, as Matthias was talking this morning in relation to the Netherlands. You know, is there a use for these uh, areas that were once regarded as being a wasteland through the Midlands? Um, is there a need to turn these into farmland? Um, and we might think that um, that would be a lost habitat, but if you look at some of the farmland areas um, in, say, around Bura, um, where there are good numbers of farmland birds occurring, lapwing particularly, um, and lapwing is a farmland bird, it's not a peatland bird at all, but a lap, lap, lapwing have very few breeding sites to the point now that um, I would suggest that some of the, the, um, the cutaway peatlands, the border mona peatlands that have been turned into agricultural land have actually become nationally important for breeding lapwing. Um, but that's not to say that lapwing are a species of bog. And I'd argue if you're doing bog restoration, when you have lapwing there, you're perhaps not doing it right. But the lapwing like dry, open landscapes. Uh, and that's perhaps not what we want to see on our peatlands. We want to see them re-wetted. And we've heard about the importance of re-wetting peatlands for carbon sequestration. So perhaps we shouldn't be looking at some species like lapwing, which will come into onto the bogs for sure. But maybe they're not what we want to see um, when the bogs are fully restored or fully rehabilitated. We might want to see species more like red grouse, like curlew, like red shank, because they are emblematic of a wetland landscape, of a habitat where there is um, these rarer, scarcer species, the more typical species of bogland. Um, but of course, our hands are uh, tied to some extent in terms of the rehabilitation or restoration of our peatlands. Um, and as we would have heard yesterday, there are so many factors at play when it comes to tackling peatlands in terms of the depth of peat, in terms of the hydrology, in terms of how the water is moving up or down or through the landscape, um, that it makes it a real challenge in order to have this one size fits all when it comes to restoration or rehabilitation. And obviously there's huge pressure on our peatlands um, in terms of forestation. Um, they're seen as being sites where we could be planting trees. Um, and Ireland obviously has targets in relation to, to forest cover. Um, some of our peatlands are really, might be really important and can be used for renewable energy projects. Um, and that's another argument, which is obviously a hot topic at the moment. And indeed, there's a good argument to say that it's a good stopgap in terms of replacing um, the fuel, the energy that was being generated from peat and replacing that with renewable energy uh, in order to meet Ireland's renewable energy targets. And that is perhaps it's remaining there. Thanks very much. And that's something, renewable energy targets is perhaps something that we do need to consider on the use of some of these peatlands, particularly where there's very small areas of peat. But that needs to be balanced again with what peat, what carbon is still being stored there. And how do we hold on to that carbon uh, within that landscape in order to mitigate against the impacts of climate change? So we have huge discussion um, that needs to be made in relation to the future of these peatlands um, in order to protect biodiversity in order to protect the birds and uh, you know, the ecosystems that support those birds in the wider landscape. And of course, um, in the future, we don't necessarily know exactly what will happen um, when we see the large tracts of Borden Mona bog that uh, Mark McCorry is gonna be talking to us about uh, later on today um, with the, the, the rehabilitation program, what will appear there? Well, as I'm sure many of you will know, we've already seen um, that some of these, um, rehabilitated sites being colonized by, by species, breeding waders coming in, but we don't know what the future will hold in terms of how those habitats will look and in terms of what species will come in onto those landscapes. And I think it's a very, very exciting time to be involved in people. Um, obviously, you know, we, we are now aware of their importance um, in terms of, of providing um, ecosystem value and um, ecosystem services. We're aware of the natural capital and increasingly aware of the natural capital associated with these peoples. 
Um, and that's not something that we were talking about 10 years ago. Um, so I think we're in a really exciting place in the relation to the future of our peatlands, the rehabilitation and restoration for our um, bird communities, um, and particularly our threatened and vulnerable bird communities, but of course the much wider ecosystems um, that those birds represent, that those birds are flagships, uh, uh, flagship or indicator species of. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much, Alec. Um, fantastic to see the, the necessity to potentially embrace change with a lot of this and that are we looking at the right birds? Are we quantifying the right things? And, and can change actually lead to, to good? Um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, who I will now move on to is um, Monica Debat from Creative for Dangan Mehul, who was one of the members of our Community Wetlands Forum. Um, and she will be talking to the very en enigmatic title of Tracks to a Layered Landscape. So very excited about this. So Monica, I see your video is working. That's great. If you can unmute there, please, and give sharing a go. So yeah, audio working, that's great. And share away. So you're coming up here now, and if you can just go full screen on that, please. Um, Lovely, we can see it at our end. You're good to go. Okay, great stuff. Okay, well, just to say, firstly, thanks to Catherine and the team and you, Shane, uh, for inviting us to, to this today. So, and also just to say that Larry Fulham of Creative Athena will be sharing the eight minutes with me. So, um, now, why is this not moved? Oh, here we go. Okay, so this, this is a shot of a temporary studio that I negotiated with Borna Mona many years ago, about 15 years ago. And being in this space has made me aware of its socio-cultural and ecological layers. Since the 1950s, generations of men have made a living at Ballydermot Works, a place where some of the most critical issues of our time are being played out. The painting titled Healing the Wound references the resilience of their fragile bog builder Spagna. The complexities of this workplace hit me as I walked the site and spoke with the workers. Conversations with the men got deep into the processes of peat excavation, from taking the skin off to the milling, the harrowing, to the final lift. Describing the geological nature of the site, a land manager spoke of how it is underlain by a white shell marl that grew in the water for many years, a marl that is even older than the 12,000 year old bogs. A disused ganger's hut in the middle of a shifting bogland became a space for drawing and thinking about how we use peatland. A land manager in the conversation notebook there talked about how 90% of border Mona workers came from rural backgrounds. Nobody wanted to see waterways polluted, but what's done is done. A the ground was... Uh, a, solit a solitary hut in my paintings became a motif for a lone witness, a gatherer of stories. Showing paintings while having conversations led to a new story. One of the men, Mock, selected a piece of partial cutaway for Plot Capoc, an art intervention that references Bordemona's practice of trial plots to test new uses for cutaway. Michael Jacob told me of an abandoned blueberry project also on Bordemona lands. The ground was cleared and planted with mature blueberry bushes with huge support from the men and still offers food to the bees. In her book, The Human Condition, Hannah Arendt asks nothing more of us than to think about what we are doing. Art interventions can provoke deep conversations about the wise use of degraded peatlands. This notebook shows sphagnum trials at Bordemona's first mind bog in a coastal and gaeltacht area of Mayo, where I walked with Catherine and the Bordemona ecology team. Conversations suggest that a cutaway bog could take hundred year, hundreds of years to reform, if ever. The slow return of a minuscule plant, palustra, subnitens, sclerosum, became the lens through which I thought, painted and conversed with fragile bog remnants. A narrow gauge track which takes you within view of a raised bog remnant has become a space for conversation, observation and drawing. Here we see local families engaging with creative Rathangan Mehel as they walk, observe and imagine the future of the tracks. The painting to the far left references a blank blackboard, a disused tractor and the point of entry to the remnant. 
This drawing is framed by Edward Said's notion of paying attention to more than one voice. It imagines sphagnum spores as they recolonize the machines and the canteen at Ballydermot Works. It asks how raised bog remnants will be cared for at this critical time of climate change. And now I hand over to Larry Fulham. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that, that, that is, I suppose, very particular to Monica's work. And that's the importance of respecting and valuing people, of giving people space, of giving them time to be seen and to be heard. And that's, that's a big part of um, our seminars. While we bring in uh, people with expertise, it's also important for us to gather people from local communities and give them space to talk about what's happening to our boglands and maybe how we can cooperate and, and dealing with the changes that are coming down the track towards us. Okay, now, okay. One of the slides that I, I use very often when I'm talking to people about the importance of Board Mamon and the importance, part, important part that, that TARP has played in the local economy is this one here from the emergency era. When Ireland was powered by TARP, we had no coal and locally, Hundreds of men were drafted in by the government, along with army, army men, to build hostels and to cut turf by hand to ensure that we didn't go cold. This was the start of a process that transformed our community and communities across the Midlands. And as yet, there has been no effort made to capture and tell the story in a systematic fashion. Few minutes remaining, Larry. Right, okay. Um, the other thing, uh, again, you can pick up uh, uh, this team of people who, who worked with Borden and Mona back in the, in the 1940s, all settled here. Over 100 people uh, from that era settled here, married, raised families, and connected us with uh, large parts of the, of, the, of, of the country. I'm going to skip on because I've less time than I thought I had. Um, one of the things that, uh, I, we, again, we used to go back and look at our history and, and how, how wide the story we have to tell are the bog bodies. They take us beyond the, the Norman uh, notion of the bogs as barriers to conquest and repositories of rebellion. And they show us a time when there actually was a more uh, intimate connection with, with the land. And um, if we even look at, at things like the stories of the, the Fianna, we find again that there was, there, was, there was a more intimate connection with the bogs and that we had a better understanding of the relationship between ourselves and, and nature. Um, sorry, um, this is playing, oh yeah. Now, some years ago, uh, Michael Jacob pointed out that the Borden Mona narrow gauge railway links all of the uh, communities in West Kildare that grew up and depended on Borden Mona for employment and that they could become a way of linking us together in the future as, as there are developments. At the moment, uh, we have a, a large uh, landfill at a place called Drehit near Allen Wood, solar farms planned, wind farms planned, and there's a sense of a disconnect between what Bordnamona plans and its past, of a story that was created with Bordnamona and the SB, but one that's been forgotten. It seems to me you cannot have a just transition if you discard a significant part of your past and treat the people who were involved in that past as irrelevant to the future. So here we are uh, looking across one of Bordnamona's narrow gauge railways. And the question that, 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 that uh, we're trying to address is, how can you have a, a just transition when you ignore certain voices, when you ignore part of your past? And it's interesting this morning, there was an article on the uh, newspapers uh, uh, from the EPA talking about the need for societal change. I don't think we're going to have effective societal change if we cannot look and value the stories of the people who brought us this far. Thank you. Monica and Larry, thank you very, very much for that uh, engaging and, and different talk, I suppose. Um, and it's important to focus on, or at least reflect on the, the value of art and culture, both historical, present and future um, to all of this. So that's very important. Thank you very much, Monica, if you want to mute yourself there. Uh, Catherine, I see you've now started to, to share already. That's brilliant. You're firing ahead. Um, so last night in this session is our, our very own Catherine Farrell. She'll be talking about peatlands in peril restoring for the future. So Catherine, take it away, please. I see you're sharing already. Off you go. 
Yeah, can you hear me there, Shane? <clears throat> kind of did, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Right. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for all the great presentations so far. I hope I don't bring the standard down. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in applying the United Nations framework on ecosystem accounting in Ireland. So this is often referred to as natural capital accounting, which Alec uh, actually referred to in his own presentation. So we're trialing this approach in Ireland as part of the In Case project. And just at this point, I have to say big shout out to my colleagues, Lisa and Jane, they're on the call and Danny Norton, because nothing ever happens in isolation. All these people are just amazing. So we're trialing this approach as part of the In Case project. Uh, building on some of the work that I was doing in Board Namona uh, up until 2019. And really, it's all about trying to bring nature more into decision making through a very highly standardized integrated process. So in terms of the approach, I want to introduce this concept. So after Rio, the big conference in 1992, I think the world recognized that we need to start to bring nature into decision making. So flash forward 20 years, or, or 30 is it? In 2021, the UN adopted this, the system of environmental economic accounting, and specifically the ecosystem accounting module as a global standard. Now this will be mandatory in the EU in the next few years, and it is also highlighted in the EU Green Deal as a mechanism to deliver on all the great things it sets out towards net zero, et cetera. So, and also the UK and the Netherlands have been really leading on this since 2010, 2010 or so. So lots of countries are taking it on now and also companies are starting to apply this ecosystem accounting approach. So I'm talking about it here because you're gonna be hearing a lot more about this. And hopefully it will influence some of our decisions for the better. Because if we look at this wonderful slide uh, over here, this picture, which outlines the sustainable development goals, we see that really the nature piece, so nature is the base of everything. Society sits within nature and economy is a subset of all of that. So we need a really, really good base if we're to get all these other things working really well. So this is a standardized way. We're working with the lead authors on it. So we're really in a good place in terms of influencing how it develops into the future, but we need to get it right from the Irish context. And just to say that the CSO did publish uh, an ecosystem accounts for peat plants and heath plants in 2018, so do check that out. So what are we doing? So this is a snapshot, and I say a snapshot. We're working at catchment level. Um, why a catchment level? Well, catchment is a physically distinct unit. Uh, it, it works everything within the catchment uh, is working together. And as Donald Daly has been really championing for a number of years, this integrated catchment management approach. So we're working on two catchments, uh, one on the East Coast, uh, the Dargal, and one in the Midlands. So the, the catchment on the East, very much uh, characterized, it has about 20% cover of peatland, mostly upland mountain blanket bog um, in a mosaic with wet heatland. In the Fidgile, we can see here that it's, it's in the heart of that Borden Mona landscape. So what we've done is we've mapped the extent of the peatlands, which is shown here in red in both catchments. What you will notice is we have a gray area here, and this actually represents what used to be the extent. So in both catchments already, we can see that the area of peatland has been reduced by almost 50%. And then we assess the condition based on available data sets, but then also site visits and using aerial imagery. And we have assessed the condition to be bad. Not really surprising, given, given that when we listened to Ray Flynn talking yesterday, he struggled to find at least one catchment in Ireland that hadn't, wasn't actually in bad condition in terms of peatlands. So we have uh, assessed it using data and using eco ecology power. What does that look like? So in the Dargal, we can see overgrazing, we can see burning, we can see effects of historical um, peat cutting, and we can also see this absolutely desperate picture that uh, Faith Wilson sent me, which shows me that, you know, most of the peatlands 
degraded in the Dargo, but not only degraded, but actually getting washed off down the hills. So that's pretty bad. So we were right in assessing that it was bad. Then in the Fidgile, of course, we know that actually most of the peatlands are in an industrialized uh, format, as well as some very sort of hungry looking cows here that are trying to eat a bit of grass off some peat fields. And not to say that these, you know, we're also looking at, you know, the cultural um, values of these landscapes. And I just threw this in here with, you know, maybe the peatlands are in as good a condition as this poor fella here on the left hand side. So peatlands need help. OK, so we found that through using this ecosystem accounting approach, what's the extent, what's the condition? So now let's go. We've looked at the stocks. Let's look at the flows. Two minutes remaining, Catherine. Yeah, thanks. And so really, this slide is as much to frighten you <laughs> to let you know that we've been really busy trying to build up a list of the array of ecosystem services that are delivered by peatlands. And, you know, this is just a snapshot. This isn't the full list, but this is what we've tried to gather data on. And the key message is in both of these catchments, we need to get out of the red and into the green. Uh, yeah, so pretty much exactly what it says here. And, and just to say ESALT who's helping us here is actually working on cultural ecosystem services next week uh, after this event. So my concluding comments are based on the approach that we've taken working at catchment scale, we can see that the peatlands in these catchments need help. They're in need of restoration. We need to return them to good stock condition and good flow. So that's a key message. And I just want to say peatlands are for life. So, you know, having a two or three year restoration program, you know, it's really not good enough. We're, at, we're on the cusp of the UN decade on restoration. So it is time to restore, but where? Who's going to do it? Uh, you know, we talked about the Bordemona peatlands, but who's going to take ownership of those uh, when Bordemona is, is finished with the rehabilitation program? Biodiversity is local. Alec talked about the species. We've got to take that into consideration. And we have to sustain the livelihoods in these healthy peatlands. And all of that must be based on science with open communication, transparent decision making. And I think this ecosystem accounting framework is a useful tool um, for that. So we need a strategic restoration plan. It can be based on ecosystem accounting approaches. And we need to get ready for all the fires and all the bog slides that are coming our way. And as Fergal pointed out, we need to actually get practical about that. Peatlands are for the future. Uh, we need to crank up the engines, get the bogs on track. We'll see some benefits in our lifetime, but really, you know, it is about the future. Uh, the long term benefits are really, Diana alluded to it, that we, we want to leave this, these peatlands in better stock than we got them. So that's the challenge to us all. There is some really good initiatives here, and I think that's what we need to work on, the results-based payment schemes. But also I want to mention the business and biodiversity platform, which has just recently been established because business can really play a role. And Shane pointed out the gap in the funding, um, and especially since we're all buying into this wonderful bioeconomy. So thank you. I hope, I know I went over time, so apologies on that. But everyone plays a role, and thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Catherine. And thanks for the, the first view of your latest album cover there as well. Great to see. Um, that's fantastic. It's, it's, we're quite tight on time, but we do have a, a couple of minutes for some questions. So um, there are some coming through on the, the question and answers there, but um, do please submit them onto the chat as well, if you like, or, or into the Q&A section. Um, <clears throat> One that I would like to, to kind of reflect on myself um, and, and one that, that somebody else had, had raised as well um, is whether these areas are naturally treeless um, and what is our baseline to assess this? Um, Catherine, I might get you to turn off your video or actually, can I get all the panels to turn on their videos? That's better. Here we go. Um, so, Alec, I might put that to you if that's possible. Um, what is our baseline here? What are we aiming for? Is it naturally treeless? Is it almost no birds, is it a greater diversity of birds? Um, and how do you reconcile that? Thanks, Shane. It's difficult to know, and it depends where we start. You know, um, I mean, we have a huge range of bogs there, and, you know, we probably need to go with what's achievable. 
Um, I mean, it's not appropriate to assume that a lot of the bogs, the degraded bogs, we can return to an intact, pristine state. I don't think that's realistic at all. I mean, I think some will go through, um, I mean, at best, some of the bogs may go through fen, transition mire, marsh, um, even open lake, open water. So I don't think we're going to be able to develop sort of peat farming habitats in the vast majority of our degraded peatlands. Um, but what we can do, I suppose, is that it's a conversation to have, you know, what are the objectives for these sites? What, um, what do we want to see there? Do we want to see uh, peat farming habitats? Is that the best solution? Is that the best outcome? Or are there other outcomes? Is it, I mean, in some cases, it won't even be achievable, you know, where cutaway peatlands have gone down to the, the you know, the, the, the bedrock. Um, it's very unlikely that you're going to see, um, you know, it'll be thousands of years before you could even optimistically develop peat farming habitats there. So we kind of need to look and see what do we have and what can we realistically achieve. And it's going to be, have to be decided in a case by case basis. It's not going to be something that we can perhaps put blanket or generic measures or approaches on. But we need to sort of rely on the experts, the people that have you know, done the research that know what's there and know what is achievable in order to try and get the best outcomes. You know, we need to, we can't can't be putting a sort of square peg in a hole. It would be wonderful if we could return to intact peatlands, but you know that's not something that's going to be an option for the vast majority of sites in any kind of realistic way. Mm. That's okay. Yeah, I, I get that, but it is very site specific, and that we can't have a one size fits all. Um, I, I'm going to look in the chat window here. There's a couple of other things coming in. Um, again, one thing that I might try and coalesce across the various smaller questions and, and comments and talks. Is, um, is something directed at Monica and Tina here from the, the more creative artistic side. Um, in terms of oftentimes artistic projects um, being a bolt on to scientific projects to uh, you know, round it or, or increase cultural engagement or, or the longevity of these projects. Um, is there a room to reverse that and to have artistic projects at the forefront with a scientific element bolted onto that, I suppose, in the immediate reverse, in that the science could support a larger artistic creative process. Um, any thoughts on that, Tina or Monica? Yes, well, if, I, if I can come in there, I, yeah, I would think uh, very much so. I think that that it once it happens, but I think it is very important for creative collaborations. I'm, I'm involved in a big project, Creative Schools at the moment, uh, where, where we're looking specifically at um, integrating across disciplines. And you can see that model being applied to eco ecological matters as well. Um, and obviously the big climate change project will, will, will be a good one going towards that as well. So I think it's very important to have people who are committed to something like the peatlands that they come together with their with their different skills. Mm. And there are opportunities yeah, out there. Yeah. yeah. Tina, would you like to come in there? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, well, on my side, photography, I think a photograph can speak volumes, you know, it can appeal to the masses. Um, and I think I think it's a very powerful tool in con in conservation. So um, if I can help in any way, I'm I'm more than willing to yeah. collaborate. I mean, if you just look at all the presentations here, they've all used photographs of some description, some terrible, some reasonably good, and yourself obviously unbelievable photos. And the power to communicate that and to engage, because ultimately this this is people. It, it isn't just a small cohort of scientists doing this because you're not going to get anywhere with relying on that. So, um, so it's great to see that that roundedness um, and the power of, of, of that as well. Um, folks, it is well after. Can half I say 10, one thing? Can I say Catherine, one thing? Go ahead, yeah, yeah. Just coming back to that uh, trees on peatlands thing, and I think it's a really important thing that we need to say is that uh, bogs are treeless, but you can get trees establishing on the heathland areas. So. Uh, it's this thing that, you know, it, it, they are characteristically treeless. So that's just one thing to note. A little bit as well, every site difference is, is different. So you might have had a little pocket of birch or something established there. One thing's for sure, they were never as, as grazed and uh, to reduce grazing will work. The second thing is the art and ecology. Um, myself and Paddy Woodward, uh, will be featuring on Culture File. I may imagine a Culture File with me on, a, on Lyric FM on Saturday evening at 6.30, where we talk about the role that art plays in restoration ecology and bringing people back in connection with nature. And I actually do mention a lot of um, Monica's work and Tina's work is mentioned as well. So there'll be a heavy reference there on peatlands. So I hope that's a valid contribution for putting in across you. Apologies. 
Thank you. Okay, folks, um, we will round off. I can't see anything else coming in on the chat for the Q&A. Um, it is now 10.35. Uh, Easels or others, can you confirm that we're now returning at 11 a.m. for session seven? Exactly, right? yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Um, thanks very much to our group of five speakers, obviously to Matthias and Catherine before that as well. Um, we will reconvene at 11am on the dot earlier if possible to get things rolling.